Who can you trust? Who can you trust nowadays? Let's see, let's go through some of the major you know, institutions that we're asked to trust. Uh, the government? And I'm not picking political parties here, that's not my job. I'm just saying the government, generically. You know, can we trust the government? What was the old story? I, I'm here to help you, I'm from the government. <laughs> Wastes a lot of our taxpayer dollars. Uh, large corporations have defrauded their shareholders. Banks, we used to be able to trust the bank. You know, put your money in the bank, even banks manipulating the interest rates, manipulating the stock market. Individuals who once were automatically trusted, the coach, the kind old neighbor, even church workers are now viewed with suspicion in light of recent events and scandals. It's no wonder that one emerging problem in our society is mistrust. We're finding it harder and harder to trust one another. Behavioral scientist Jack Gibb conducted an in-depth study into ways that people trust each other. Very interesting, the results that he got. In this study he named seven primary factors that result in people losing trust in each other or never gaining trust to begin with. Seven factors, he said. Seven factors that kill trust. Number one, being judgmental. People tend to distrust those who they feel are judging them. That's not a shock, is it? Number two, he says, acting superior. We tend to avoid people who think they are better than we are. We don't trust them. Number three, being indifferent. Trust requires sharing and vulnerability. Two things difficult to do with a person who doesn't seem to care. Number four, exercising control. People who are always trying to find, use, and maintain control. Controlling people tend to create resentment in others, not trust. Number five, the exact opposite. People who express certainty about everything. It's difficult to establish the rapport necessary to create a trusting relationship with someone who knows everything who has the answer to everything. Number six, being manipulative. Manipulative tactics are death to trust because they usually hide selfish motives. And number seven, he said, being untruthful. Of course, that's the bottom line one, being untruthful. Trust is based on our confidence that the other person is telling the truth, even when it can't be proven. So when it comes to trust, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a political leader that we could trust, not just before elections, but during their entire term in office? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could trust companies to sell us products that wouldn't kill us, or the environment, or make us pay more for them than they're really worth? or cheat their own employees. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be great if we could trust the judicial system to be fair to everyone? Wouldn't we have a great society if we could trust employers to treat us and our families like they would treat their own family? You know, I wish we could trust the media to report what was true, to entertain us with what is good and noble, to educate with what will build us up, and what peace there would be if we could trust our family, our brethren, and our friends to always tell us the truth and always tell the truth about us. I wish that when I said, trust me on this one, people would. You know, a friend of mine said to me recently, I like to help people, but I don't trust anyone with my problems. You ever hear that? You ever hear somebody say that? Did you ever hear that come out of your own mouth? It seems that 
Our general mistrust of people, institutions, and one another is causing us to become cynical and lonely and unhappy. We hesitate to trust anyone with our problems. And this mistrust breeds despair and ultimately a loss of hope and faith and the love generated by that faith. No wonder the present generation is so discouraged. It doesn't trust anyone and as a consequence has not been able to give itself to a cause that might spark devotion and love and consequently joy. In answer to this black hole of mistrust, this Bermuda triangle of cynicism, God offers us His Son, Jesus Christ. Someone to believe in, someone to trust, someone to keep alive in each of us the flame of hope. In Jesus we find that one person who will never do anything to cause us to lose trust in Him. Isn't that wonderful? We have found someone that will never, ever do anything, that has never, ever done anything, that has never said anything to cause us to doubt or mistrust Him. In my worst moment, in my worst discouragement, there's always one prayer that I can make, and that is, dear Lord, no matter what's happening to me, you are always worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen? Amen. So in his study, I go back to Jack Gibbs, he found seven reasons why people lose trust in each other. Tonight I'd like to give you three reasons why you should trust Jesus Christ. Here they are, number one, you should trust Jesus because He is human. He was human. Go to Philippians chapter two, verse five to eight, and I'll explain what I mean by that idea of that you can trust Him because He was human. Philippians chapter two, beginning in verse five says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Why should you trust Jesus? Because he knows what it's like to be human. You know, one of the strongest factors that uh, creates mistrust is unfamiliarity. We don't understand the language, so we suspect people who don't speak our language. We're cautious of people who are of a different skin color or perhaps of a different culture or a different background. We're uncomfortable with those who practice uh, and, and have traditions that may be different than ours. Not better, not worse, they're just different. We become suspicious. Paul tells us that Jesus was equal with God, another way of saying being divine. Imagine how encouraging it would be if Jesus had uh, uh, remained in heaven and simply sent prophets to tell us to believe and repent and be baptized and live faithfully till the end. But He stayed up in heaven. He just sent, you know, every decade or so He'd send down a prophet, every hundred years He'd send down a prophet to give us the message, but He stayed in heaven. He said, well, you do all that, you'll be with me in heaven. I don't think many would follow. I don't think too many would give up their lives for a leader who was so far away that he couldn't be seen, he couldn't be heard, he couldn't be touched. But Jesus didn't do that. He became human like us. He lived like us. He suffered like we do. And he died like we will all die. People in the military you know, have a a greater love and loyalty for those officers who share the risk with them than the desk generals who are safe from harm's way back home and who fly in and come and visit with the you know, guards and you know, making sure that nothing happens to them. We can trust Jesus. Even though He comes from heaven and abides there now, 
He was for a time, He was one of us. And because of that, He can relate to our fears, He can relate to our pain, and He can also relate to our hopes. So we can trust Him because He knows what it's like to be like us. Secondly, we can trust Him because He spoke the truth. John chapter 14, verse six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. One of the most, if not the most, critical qualities that makes or breaks a relationship is the truthfulness of partners. You know, I've seen that many times in doing counseling with couples. One or, or another partner can you know, say some nasty things, have bad habits, you know, just so on and so forth. But the, but the thing that, that breaks the relationship, usually, that, that's hard to con, come back from, is a lie. Not the action. The action can be forgiven because we recognize we're all weak, we all make mistakes. You know, it's the lie. How many times have I heard the wife or the husband say to me, oh, I just, it's the lie, she lied, he lied to me. And the lie went on for months and months and everything that was said, I, I don't know what's true anymore. You know, people will put up with a lot of strange behavior, weird hobbies and moodiness in their spouses, but they just cannot take dishonesty. Dishonesty is the killer. When someone lies, even a little bit, it affects every other part of the relationship. We can have complete confidence in Jesus because He was completely honest with us. And we know this to be true in several ways. I'm not just saying it because I'm saying it. For example, everything that was said about Him in the Old Testament came out to be true. Where He would be born, how He would live and die, what type of person He would be, everything they said about Him in the Old Testament came to be in the New. He fulfilled perfectly all the things that were predicted about Him. And so His coming and appearance was based on truth. Secondly, everything that He said that He would do, He did. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a government, a friend, a boss, a, a teacher, a coach, or whatever, someone we look up to who always follows through on what they say? Well, everything that Jesus said He would do, He did it. One way to determine someone's honesty is to measure words and deeds. Not only was Jesus never caught in a lie, but he lived exactly according to his own teachings. He taught that we ought to love our enemies. And while his enemies were torturing him and murdering him, what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Luke 22, 34. He just didn't talk the talk, but he walked the walk. How discouraging it is when people we look up to and we hope that they will uh, uh, um, set the pace and set the example, don't do that. But we can't say that about Jesus. What He talked about, He lived. What He said that we should do, He did perfectly. And another reason that we can trust Him is everything that He said would happen has happened. For example, he said that one would betray him. Well, Judas betrayed him. He said that he would die and resurrect, and he did. He said that they would uh, be persecuted, his apostles and followers would be persecuted, and they were. He promised that he would always be with the apostles and enable them to do miracles in his name, and the New Testament records many of the miracles that the apostles did in His name. So you can trust a person when everything they say about Him is true, when everything He does is in line with what He says, and everything He tells you that is going to happen actually 
happens. That person is worthy of your trust. You can trust Jesus Christ because He has told you the truth about everything. You can also trust the Lord because He has your interests at heart, your best interests at heart. I've had people say that to me in my life. You know, I only have your best interests at heart and then somewhere down the line I was out of a job. You know what I'm saying? That's <laughs> and I'd go home saying, wait a minute, how's this helping me here? <laughs> In his research on trust, Jack Gibb noted that the desire to control and judge and manipulate others were traits that either destroyed trust or never allowed trust to develop in the first place. When we review Jesus' life, we can easily see that He did not live for Himself. He lived for other people. He didn't come to control us. He certainly didn't come to manipulate us or to judge us. On the contrary, we were out of control. We were being manipulated by Satan and our sinful desires and subject to judgment, condemnation, and eternal damnation. He offered His perfect, sinless life on the cross to atone for our sins, and the results of that. Are the results of His sacrifice good for us? Well, take a look at your life. We have regained control of our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. We're no longer manipulated because we have God's word and the church to teach us and protect us and strengthen us. No one can manipulate us. You ever watch TV and talk back at it? I do that, my poor wife, you know, I'm watching the news and I'll pause it. I say, see what he just said? Oh, this is not true at all, that's spin. You know? And she says to me, let's just watch the news, shall we? <laughs> but we're no longer manipulated. We cannot be manipulated. We know the truth about things. Oh, we may not know the truth about you know, high, higher math or the truth about the history of some obscure tribe in South, I'm not talking about academic truth, I'm talking about the truth of how life works. We know that. We cannot be manipulated. And we are no longer judged, no longer subject to condemnation because our guilt and our judgment have been washed away in the waters of baptism. There's no reason why Christians should feel guilty. All this made possible by who? By Jesus, who as John says in John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, this Jesus laid down His life for us. I'm going to tell you something, I can trust someone who died for me. I have nothing to lose. I already owe Him my life. So I think if our hearts were revealed, we would see that the person we trust the most is us. The person we trust the most is me. I don't mean you trust me, I mean I trust me and you trust you. Perhaps there are good reasons for this. Maybe your parents didn't instill trust in you. Maybe a parent abandoned you when you were younger. Maybe you were abused. Who knows? Maybe when you were younger uh, and even in your adult life, you've been hurt by too many disappointments, too many liars in your life. And maybe you're looking out at the world and you've become cynical about it because you've seen how much dishonesty there is. And the results of these experiences has been that we have secretly made the decision to trust only us and no one else. When I was younger and my dad died when I was 15 and I stood there and I watched him, he had a heart attack and he just died right in front of me. Okay, no college for this boy. 
now working after school and working in the summertime wasn't just for fun, it was to make sure that we had enough food in the house between my mother and I. And I remember way back then, that little voice inside of me, and I remember it as a kid growing up, saying, I'm never going to let anyone else hurt me. Because my dad, not his fault, he didn't want to die on that night. But when he died suddenly, without saying goodbye, he hurt me. And I decided on that night, no one else was ever going to do that to me again. Was that a wise decision on my part? No. That's a 15 year old boy's decision. But I hung on to that decision for 15, 20 years. Took a long, long time for somebody special to say, you know what your problem is? You don't trust people. And she was right. Maybe a decision that will protect you from certain hurts in this world, a decision like this might protect you from certain decisions in this world, but that kind of attitude will stunt your growth in Christ. It's okay to have that attitude as a 15 year old boy who's hurt and so on and so forth, but if you are a mature person in Christ, that's the wrong attitude for you to have. You see, the whole point of Christianity is that you give up trusting in idols, you give up trusting in money, you give up trusting in your own talent, you give up trusting in worldly institutions, and you give up trusting even in yourself, and you put all your trust in Jesus Christ. That's the point. I tell my children, our children, when they're having difficulties at work or challenges in their life and they're saying, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what the Lord wants me to do, and so on and so forth, and I always give them the same answer. And the answer is, it's always about faith. It's always about faith. The rest of it is just, you earn a living, you build a house, you have a kid, you go to the lake, da 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 da, -da you eat, you, know, you do this, you do that, you go to school, you know, whatever. You know, you're, you're doing stuff, you're alive in this world, you have to function. But what, what is it about? It's always about faith. Every single time it's always about faith. Every single story here is always about faith. It's always about God saying to Noah, and God saying to somebody else, God saying to Moses, God saying to Peter, God saying to Paul, God saying, do you trust me or not? Do you trust me or not? Did you realize that the point of most of your experiences as you live the Christian life is to teach you to stop trusting whatever you trust and trust Jesus instead? Think about it, Noah had to learn this by building a boat in the middle of nowhere. And Abraham had to learn this because he had to leave his home and go to a place he'd never been to before. And Moses had to learn this. He had to lead a million people. This guy who was alone in the desert with sheep. And David had to learn this. How? By years on the run. And Peter and Paul and John, they had to learn this. And yes, you and I, we also have to learn this lesson as well. Do you Trust Jesus Christ. You should, because He understands you. He knows you, He created for you, He created you, He died for you. He knows every zig and zag of your life. He knows every motivation for every decision. He knows everything about you. And He is truthful and He is reliable and He cares for you more than you care for yourself. I'll tell you something, you've hurt yourself, but He never has. I've done damage to myself many, many times based on the decisions that I've done, the things that I've consumed, the stupid things that I tried to do. I've hurt me physically and emotionally and spiritually, but Jesus never has. He's disciplined me, but He's never hurt me. 
So I ask you, what will it take for you to place your trust in Him today? Will it mean doing it His way instead of your own way? Will it mean that you will get help for a problem? Will it mean that you'll obey the gospel? You'll do what He says for you to do to express your faith in repentance and baptism? Will it mean starting over or hanging on? What does trust in Christ mean for you? And I want to tell you something, it means something specific for every single person sitting here tonight. Whatever it means, trust Jesus on this one. You will not be disappointed if you put your faith in Him. And so the invitation <laughs> kind of expresses itself, doesn't it? If you need help to trust in Jesus Christ, and many of us do, then the church is here to help you. If you need to express your faith in Him for the very first time, publicly, through repentance and baptism, we're here three times a week and we call on you three times a week for whoever comes to do this very thing. And if you need to trust in Him in such a way that perhaps you need a new start as a Christian and you need the help of the church to give you the strength and to keep you accountable for that new start, come forward. Let the elders put their hands on you and pray for you and give you the strength to trust in Jesus Christ with everything in your life. Will you think about that as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement?